Okay, so welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming. It's my pleasure to introduce Dene Ford Robinson, who uh, actually interned a few years ago at Microsoft Research. And she's a doctoral candidate at North Carolina State University, a Microsoft Research Fellow, NSF Fellow, and a National GEM Consortium Fellow. And today she's gonna talk to us about designing infrastructure for help in online web programming communities. So please go ahead. Thanks. Thanks for the intro, Tom. So again, I pretty much know everyone in this room, but I'm Danae Ford Robinson, um, and I'm going to talk to you all about uh, the Yahoo Answers for Programmers, essentially. So I'm talking about how we can bridge or understand the barriers to communities like Stack Overflow as a framework, and learn how we to target this few people who are, have help with contributing, and how we can use those as a way to build interventions. So there's a lot of ways as well. Um, but to get started, I want to make sure your wheels are turning in the right direction. So you can close your eyes, about 10 seconds, take a beat. And I want you to imagine what a software engineer looks like. I say, Andy, close your eyes. Don't just look at me. <laughs> 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 OK, that's, uh, that's, that's it. Um, let's be honest, you're probably thinking of someone who looks like this. All right, so <laughs> um, but I want to challenge you to shift your thinking a bit, to think of the diverse group of people learning to code and thus entering the technical workforce. So with tools like Coursera or uh, Girl Developer, these coding boot camps, a lot of people are learning to code. There's a big emphasis on getting everyone to code. But what about the resources to keep them there? Um, so uh, there's a few people learning to code, but I want to be able to uh, understand how we can target the few experiences of the few diverse people learning and how we can really understand how we can increase that to help the many. And so targeting the few help the many. That's going to be the theme throughout this work, essentially. Um, and a lot of people do need help. Uh, I mentioned about who's learning to code. So by show of hands, you can raise them high. How many of you have heard of Stack Overflow? OK, keep your hand raised if you ever posted there. OK, that's all I have to do. Yeah, yeah. It's OK, it's OK. No, that's reasonable, that's reasonable. Um, so for those of you who may not be familiar, I think everyone raised their hands. <laughs> you, you posted there? Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a lot of people who don't. There's a lot of people who don't, right? So those who aren't familiar with Stack Overflow, this is an example of the thread. Um, there were there about, as of mid-February, there was about 17 million questions. And this is one of the examples of what it looks like. And uh, this is one of the 26 million answers. So just to give you an example of uh, what it looks like, you see who's posting their, their rankings, their points, as well as who's asked, um, just to just give you an idea of what it looks like. Um, but you can guess from these millions of posts that a lot of people do contribute, but there's quite a few who don't. You looked around the room and still had their hands up. Um, and to really drive that home, I'm going to introduce the motivating example of Asha, the programmer. So uh, let's consider Asha. She's a programmer. Let's say she's at Microsoft. Um, and she encounters a programming error. So let's say a compiler error. She copies it into Bing, not Google this time. So tailor my talk, right? So I copy it into Bing. Um, and then Stack Overflow is one of the top responses that popped up. From there, she finds the answer that kind of matches what she has, um, or a question that matches hers, goes down to the answer, uh, but doesn't quite work for what she's doing right now. Um, so because it doesn't, she finally musters up enough courage to post her own question. But while she's posting, she types the body and the title of the question, something stops Asha. We want to be able to figure out what that is. So a couple of things could be happening. One, it could be that Asha doesn't see other people who look like her. I mentioned about you can see who edited and asked the question. Um, here you don't really have to include an image of what you look like, but she doesn't see when based on names the images look like her. Also, there's maybe unfamiliar norms and expectations of how to contribute to the community. So here's an example of a question that was marked as protected, where it says to prevent thanks and me too and spam from new users. So it's very explicit um, in the content, but that can be discouraging. You can see how that can be discouraging. Third, Asha may think her question is a duplicate. So when on Stack Overflow, when you type in the title of your question, uh, you will start to see other similar questions. I have a clicker with a pointer. Yeah, questions pop up. Um, it may feel like if you're adding clutter to the community that you find so valuable before, that has such high utility. So, so these are just examples of what may be plaguing Asha and other developers, even in this room, their experiences. Um, but I, in order to get a bigger understanding of this, I want to ground it in who's using Stack Overflow, period. So, so Stack Overflow has about 50 million visits per month. And this is according to the developer survey they produce every um, year. Um, 
of that amount, about 10 million people have accounts. So it's a small percentage of people who are actually uh, engaged or start to get engaged and then uh, do not post. Also, um, there's less than, to give an idea of the demographics in the community, there's about less than 7% of women contributing in open source. And this includes Stack Overflow, GitHub, and this is from a couple of surveys over time. But this is really low comparison the number of women who are developers in industry, um, the software engineers in the classroom, the upcoming people in computer science courses. Another number, I'm really just throwing numbers at you right now, but a, a third of the users have less than five years experience. So there's a lot of people learning to code I mentioned. Uh, so this is the, from the de Stack Overflow developer survey as well, where you see that the large percentage of people are learning in this slot. And this is really, again, I'm just throwing a lot of numbers at you here to drive home um, a point of who's engaging on the platform. There's also this economic opportunity that some people may be missing out on. So on Stack Overflow, you can get paid uh, between or based on $50 to $100 an hour based on having more than 5,000 to 20,000 points or even contributing to open source projects online. So there's, a, there's an opportunity here. So I'm trying to drive on the point that a lot of people don't contribute. I, sorry, I didn't understand you. What was the opportunity? Oh, the, the financial gain, uh, opportunity to have a career, economic opportunity to have a career in tech, so. But unrelated to Stack Overflow? Oh, no, no. Oh. No, so people, excuse me? Oh, no, no, Stack Overflow, this is a good question. No, uh, Stack, this is people who are having, so job postings, so this is career postings that were, had requirements or some of the application materials requested that if you had, these were highlights to them, if you had between five and 20,000 points, um, if you contributed to other open source projects. So they, these, these were highlights. Stack Overflow was used as a, as a, as a, uh, an attribute for hiring. Yeah, so essentially, so you can consider open uh, community service in a way, right, right, yeah. right? So you're contributing to your developers. Yeah. Hiring managers would look at your Stack Overflow score and say, great. Yes, and so some people put it on their resume. Yeah. Yeah. Good question, good question. Um, so I'm really trying to overload the problem here, which is programmers, especially underrepresented users, including offices as well, have an issue in contributing to open source communities, or I'm sorry, online programming communities. And when I say online programming communities, I'll be specifically talking about Stack Overflow and kind of GitHub today for my vision, but there's others as well. There's GitLab, there's, there's Java Code Ranch, there's, there's a lot here. Um, and just to get in the range of what's happening. So do you have similar numbers for GitHub? In terms yeah, of so those are the, so the, in the, um, who was it, Anna Filipova, who was in uh, Jesse Slotnick, who's at GitHub. They did an open source survey, so it's actually at opensourcesurvey.org, and they submitted to a survey, uh, they had about, less than 7% women and non-binary individuals included in, who, who responded to that survey. So, um, so are the people in charge of GitHub aware of this? Yeah, so Anna works for GitHub. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Good okay. question. Good we'll question. Sure. Anna Filipova, who's a researcher, she, um, I think she was at GitHub for a year now. She started working on that before she got there, right before she got there, doing her postdoc. Um, and then the number that I reported as well for the Stack Overflow developer survey, Last year they had 7.6%, the year before that was like 5.8% of women. So, yes. So I know Stack Overflow covers topics beyond programming, right? I mean, there's finance and pop culture and all that kind of stuff. Have you looked at the diversity figures for non-software um, topics to see if it's any better in any other sub-communities? So that's a good question. So the Stack, so they're under the Stack Exchange umbrella, and I'll, talk a little, I'll show a, a picture of over, there's over 172 communities under the Stack Exchange umbrella. So there's math and travel. Um, so there's numbers that say that on the math of that Stack Exchange, there were a high percentages of women, mm -hmm. so more like 20%. Mm -hmm. But that was a separate study that someone did. Okay. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah. But you can consider it, well, I'm like diving too deep into the woods. I may, I may be diving too deep into the weeds. I'll come, come back to that later okay. as well. So good question, good question. Okay, um, so what makes this problem really hard is being able to understand um, this community without stereotyping or ostracizing them. So we want to be able to accommodate, or not accommodate, but understand the experience. So to do that, I'm doing, I'm working at the intersection of software engineering, social computing as well, um, using mixed methods. So again, trying to understand the experience. So some things can't just be quantified in a number. It's great to have the statistics to understand what's happening uh, at scale, but we're missing out on the sentiment, on the experience. 
my future work could dive into uh, identity signals, and I'll talk a little bit more that at the end. So first, I'm going to talk about how we are identifying barriers as a framework I mentioned earlier, and using those barriers as this framework for interventions to build increased participation to the mentorship. So project one. So to do this, I mentioned, I emphasized a little bit about the group that's not participating. So we're starting there. So the first research question is, what barriers do women on staff overflow face? And how do these barriers, for our research question two is how do these barriers vary by gender? There's also a third research question here, which you can't really see, but I won't cover it much, but I can talk more about it, which is how these barriers manifest across uh, experiences. So whether or not you have an account, uh, full-time student versus full-time developer. So. I'll be doing awkward pauses to wait for questions, so, <laughs> so it's okay. Um, so again, I'm doing this, we started with this mixed methods approach. So RQ1 will really start with these uh, semi-structured interviews, and RQ2 kind of emphasizes this globally distributed survey um, with men and women, so it was a binary version. So first part of the experiment was conducting semi-structured interviews with women. We recruited about 20, we had 25 respondents, and 22 actually joined the interviews. And one of which was identified as a top ranked user of all time. And um, so it's important to understand this person's experience because of this first 21, they were identifying what's stopping them, what's inhibiting their participation. Welcome. But with the top one, we could figure out how these may not be barriers for this person. And we can encourage others, the 21 participants, to have this experience. So to get an understanding of what that looks like, we asked about scenarios. We asked them about scenarios for why they would participate. Um, even propose other incentives that they may not have been familiar with. Um, yeah. So again, uh, the demographics here were the students, professionals, lurkers, which are half the room essentially, people who look but don't contribute, um, as well as active users. Okay. So the interview analysis, um, myself and two of my collaborators uh, transcribed the 22 transcripts and identified statements that said things like, I would post, but... Um, I was going to post, but something stopped me, similar back to Asha's experience. From there, we identified 327 barrier statements. So this was Justin Smith, I think Ben Zorn's with him last year. Um, so this is us actually just tagging the same statement, just to identify that we identified that this was both a barrier. I identified that he, there was a barrier and he did as well. I'll be, no need to read the actual code, I kind of emphasize that on the next slide. From the 300, so are these barriers to actually posting a question or an answer or both? Both. Okay. okay. Yeah, good question, good question. Um, so from there we identify 14 barrier statements. They exist across three categories. I won't be talking about all 14, but uh, one of the, I, I'll explain the categories. So one of them is this muddy lens perspective, this misconception of how people should be using the community versus how they're using it. Um, uh, this lack of impersonal interactions, so people not being able to identify the human asking the question, right, the humanity in it. Um, and then the third was these on-ramp roadblocks, so thinking about Asha's experience, where everyone had every intention to post, uh, but was inhibited by some other force. Uh, I'll talk about three. Um, so the first one I'll talk about was qualifications, which is similar to that quote right there. So again, these were quotes from women. Um, so one participant going on to say, I don't feel like my expertise is enough for me to actually post an answer. Um, that would be of any help to anyone else. So this sounds a lot like something we've seen in offline spaces as well. Imposter syndrome, right? So it's really cool to be able to identify these experiences that exist in these offline spaces and not have empirical evidence for how they exist here. So another one, another participant went on to say, um, this is for onboarding hoops. I feel like everyone else already knows what it is to post that it is. And I want to stay away from the extra work to figure out how to use it. Just, just figure out what that etiquette is. Um, and all the little social, unspoken kinds of dialogue. So this is going back to the idea of those unfamiliar norms, engaging in a new space. Yes. Can you clarify what the, how many years of experience these women had with hmm. Stack Overflow that you were asking them about? Like, is it something they had just seen like in the last couple months, or is it something they've been using for years? So this is something they've all been using for for a while, for more than a year. Okay. Um, and they're developed, so they're, what we asked out in the paper is the development experience, so that's different because some of them are students right versus the industry. Um, so when we ask them about their experiences, we ask them to refer to their last concrete experience on Stack Overflow, so likely the day before or even earlier that day during the interview. 
So, yeah. I mean, think about how often we go to Sacramento Fluid and Time, right? Good question, good question. Okay, so the third one I'll cover was the sphere of negative feedback. So this participant goes on to say, it's hard enough to ask for help, but to ask for help and get rude help is kind of like never mind, right? This disengagement. So I, I kind of branded this as conflict avoidance, but it's really just, I, I really don't like using that term, I should have changed it, which is really just the unlikelihood to engage in this violent behavior, and toxic behavior, I guess. Just a contextual question. So yeah. all 22 of your interviewers from North America? Good question. With three, about five of them were conducted on Skype. Um, so I don't know what country they were in. So, but, 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 people, but the other part were conducted physically in Raleigh. Yes, so good question. Good question. Yes. So I guess in terms of this question, um, I don't really have a good feel. I mean, I, I haven't looked at it from that perspective. But you know, how much rude behavior is there on Stack Overflow? I mean, is there sort of as a as a separate analysis? What's oh, that? Ninety-nine percent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm just trying to you know get a, a game. lot of trolls on Stack right. so, yeah. yeah. Obviously, it happens in many different forums, and I'm just curious um, how. Right. So so you know, as a fundamental challenge for the whole uh, kind of approach, right, is it, you know, the fact that people have these bad behaviors um, seems, you know, troubling and difficult to, to understand or, you know. How, how active are the administrators? Like in Reddit, they'll shut an account down ASAP. Like the minute someone gets rude, somebody steps in and that account is gone. And they'll delete the offensive comments as well. So how active are they? So the moderators are fairly active. They're actually doing elections for moderators right now um, on Stack Overflow. Um, but I would say that Reddit has a different moderation content sure. strategy yeah. um, than Stack Overflow does. And Stack Overflow has been around longer. So the tone that's allowed on the platform, or that's normalized, that's already been normalized, um, is there versus, um, and uh, there's a whole different other part of that too, because Reddit has been working with a lot of academic researchers as well. Um, so Susan Benish, who was at Harvard, who was doing a lot with um, uh, Nathan Matias on this uh, civility, increasing civility in these platforms, mm -hmm. and how you can encourage um, positive or voluntary compliance. So, but Stack Overflow, that, so, that's something that's been happening for a while, and Stack Overflow is just me, I guess, right now. <laughs> so, when somebody is going to respond to a question on Stack Overflow, what information do they get about the asker of the question besides the question itself? Yes, so when you are going to respond, so you're answering a question. Yeah. Right, so you can see the what time it was asked, who that person is by their profile image. You can see their username, given in the display, their points, the number of badges they have, the the tags of the question. You can click on the name. So I'm really going depth here, but you can click on the name, and be able to see what country they're from, uh, what other questions they've asked. Period. What other answers they've asked, and what other badges they have as well. Um, and now you can even start to see a developer profile as well. So it's, an explicit CV that Stack Overflow has. So jobs is their main bread and butter. So they really try to encourage people to be um, to pull their full information on there and fully disclose more. So you have access to a lot if you're willing to go into the week, right? If you're if you're that type of answer and you want to know more about who you're responding to. And there have been experiences when people have said, you know, um, I've seen that you asked a silly question like this before somewhere else, or in, and refer to a previous experience. So good question. Okay. So I'll lightly call mm -hmm. RQ2, and then well, we'll just keep going. We'll see how long it goes. Um, but for RQ2, we want to understand how these barriers vary by gender. Um, so after myself and my colleagues analyzed transcripts, we determined the 14 barriers. We submitted a survey, and this or we distributed a survey. And this survey had 14 questions, or 15 questions, really. 14 of them uh, with the 14 barriers, asking them, <coughs> how likely is this a, to be a barrier for you? Um, and that, so liquor scale from one through five is really hard to see there. Um, and then we asked another question, which was, you know, are there any barriers that we missed? We want to be able to understand if there was a contribution that we were just didn't have here. Um, from that, we received uh, responses from about over 1,400 developers, and we identified five of those barriers that were significantly hindering women specifically. So, uh, of the 15 barriers, or of the 14 barriers, or the responses that they gave, all of them fit into the existing 14. Uh, yes. I didn't understand. The question was whether they had personally encountered that barrier or whether they would think that was a barrier. How often is this a barrier for you? 
So we're asking about their personal experience. Good, good point. We wanted to make this as concrete as possible. So again, um, talk about your own experience. Um, so good question. Um, what was the target of population? Like how did you recruit these people? Yeah, so good question. So we were recruited through our, kind of our snowball sampling. So the way we distribute the survey were in, in Raleigh, we have a research triangle park. Mm -hmm. So we have a slew of developers from all over. We have IBMs, like uh, the works. Um, and my collaborators were kind of geodispersed. It was Philip Guo at the time, he was in New York. And then he came down to here at one point. And then he went down to uh, UC San Diego. When I say here, it means at Microsoft for a bit. So, yeah. OK, cool. Yeah. Um, so you'll notice here, so we had about 134 women and over 1,300 men identify. Um, so you notice here that the alpha level says 0 0.0012. That's because the double, the, all the comparisons we did across the user status and the employment status as well. So that we've done the correction to reduce that level. Um, what I want to show you here is that these are the five barriers we identified to be significant. So here's the qualifications one I mentioned earlier, so that imposter syndrome. And so it's interesting to see again that that is one that's highlighted a lot for underrepresented groups for engaging in platforms. And we're seeing the same thing here. So offline communities as well as online. I also boxed this fear of negative feedback down here below. Um, no, it was not significant, but again, I just wanted to demonstrate that these barriers exist across the spectrum. Okay. Kind of yeah. question is, uh, can you go back? Mm -hmm. So what's, what's uh, so how often is uh, the barrier? Is yes. More often One, to right? Or? Yes, yes. Uh, it's the same as left to right. Strongly agree or strongly disagree. Yeah. Oh, so strongly agree oh. is to the left? Or? Yes, strongly disagree. OK. Strongly agree, oh. yes. Yep, so it should be consistent with that one. Oh, these papers, you'll notice that at the bottom there's titles of stuff. This was published at FSC in 2016, and the other ones will say the conference and press that before. Would interpret the F size? Was yeah, so, so uh, you, I would interpret it as, well, 0 to 3 being low, 4 to 6 being medium, 6 to 9 being high. So we're seeing the medium effect size so of how often, or how can this expand to generalizability to other populations? Does that make sense? So medium generalizability, I suppose. Good question. OK. So I, I, again, I just really, really want to drive home the point that these barriers exist across the spectrum. So what I'll show you next is a, a diverging stacked bar chart, where this green to orange spectrum identifies women. This blue to mustard identifies men. Um, and you'll notice again that these stars are, uh, are ones that were significant, barriers that were significant. Yes. Another question, sorry. Yes. Uh, do you have data that you, uh, you collected for these folks? Um, with respect to how often they actually contributed to Stack Overflow? No, no. no. We, we, it was, so when we, when we asked them, we interviewed them, we did not request their uh, profiles. Because so, I mean, many of them had accounts, but they didn't log into them before. So there's another person who did a survey, Roger Slag, I don't remember where he's at now, but 60% of people have like, made an account and only have one point, which means you get one point for just logging your name. Right. right. Yeah. So it's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I was looking at the, um, the, the, the league um, that you posted, which I'd never seen before. And the, uh, I mean, the number of people who have, um, I mean, basically, it's like nobody contributes. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, I, I wonder, I mean, I can understand that there's, there's clearly a difference, as you've shown, in terms of the perception of the barriers, but it seems like nobody's contributing. Yeah. To a first approximation. So, it's funny you mentioned that. So, um, a long time ago, my advisor, found, uh, Chris Parnan, found this value. He did like, this large scale study when he found out about 5% of the users were answering 60% of the questions. So it's a very small, elite group of, uh, who started off with Jeff Atwood's friends. Jeff Atwood's the founder. He started off with his buddies who answered questions. And that, that tone just persisted for a while. And so, yeah. So again, I just wanted to show this. Don't read this. Don't read this. Do not read it. Um, the point is to, <laughs> is to demonstrate, again, that these barriers exist across the spectrum for um, everyone. Um, and I do want to acknowledge that I mentioned ones that were significant, but I boxed the other three for a reason. So though these were important to acknowledge that these were significantly hindering women, again, the goal was to target the few, help the many. So these ones that I boxed were actually really helpful for expanding to industry and my collaborators with Stack Overflow for what they were interested in doing, what they had the resources to build on. So, yes. So I want to go back to Emily's point. I mean, could it be that the utility of Stack Overflow is because so few people post? You know, that we know that the answers, I mean, at least my experience, the answers tend to be very high quality. So maybe that quality is due to the extremely small author list. 
So this is a good question, and I think this is a this is a common debate actually. But, so what I'm hearing also is maybe there's value in having no, only a few people post. Um, and I would say that there, Sackhofer is really this half wiki, half forum in a way, um, where the forum is, the, is that transaction of being able to ask a question and get that feedback instantly. Um, but the wiki part of it, preserving it, right? Having that archive of the limited people engage. Well, that's what the accepted answers are for, right? Um, even though those accepted answers are really only for the person who ans asked the question. So um, I, think there's, I think there's two ways I could go. Yeah, sorry, I was thinking. I was going to ask you if you gathered any other demographics or split the data by any different demographics, like, like uh, yeah. Other so this so, yeah. So um, other than gender, are you referring to other user status? Gender. Yeah. So for as far as those demographics, as far as like cultural demographics, no, we didn't because we didn't request that for the participants. Mm -hmm. um, but since it kind of came up a couple times, I'll just show the slide real quick, um, which is how we split it across. Is this showing? Yeah. So this is the account activity versus experience. So uh, and these were the how the barriers resonate across these groups. So this is the other split we did. So where the I'm blocking this. Where the experience full time developers. So you can interpret this full time developers um, rated this as more. These were the ones that were significant for them. The time constraint and the qualifications to post. Time constraints can think about if you're an industry developer, you're not getting paid to put, contribute to Stack Overflow, right? You're getting paid. It's a time constraint. You don't post because you don't have time to post to Stack Overflow, right? So that's so that's consistent. You know, that's that, that like, it's logical, right? And this has accounts versus not having accounts over and it's the features. Well, you sh maybe you're not aware of features because you haven't been able to engage um, fully with the with the community. Um, so that's the only supposed to be did though. So for this set at least. So one, one thought I had was, you know, if you have a small number of people answering questions and there's an economic value to getting points, then isn't there an economic value for them to prevent other people from answering questions or to, to discourage other people from answering questions? Because in the end, you know, if somebody else answers them, they don't, and then they lose money because they don't have the same star rating or whatever, right? So this is, it seems like a, it's a structural problem with the, the relationship between making money and being a question answer at some level. So. And if that's the case, then what you have is you have an entrenched minority, uh, you know, who, you know, historically have been mostly men. I think, um, you know, defending essentially in some kind of economic terms potentially um, mm -hmm. their, you know, their authority. But there are no finite number of points, right? So no, there are not. If I get points, it doesn't preclude anybody else from getting points. Everyone can get points for an answer. It could yeah. mean that you're quicker. <clears throat> yeah, yeah exactly. Job, but yeah. it's a competition yeah. for who can answer the questions right. fastest. Which for Stack Overflow, that's a benefit. Yes, yeah. you do get badges yeah. for answering yeah. stuff yeah. faster. But it doesn't necessarily, it's not good for the people who have, you know, who have the, the authority. I, I think that's a different mindset. That's like the scarcity mindset you know, versus versus this, uh, I don't want to say growth, I don't know what the opposite term of what I'm trying to say is. Um, but going back to what Andy and Nachi are saying, there's opportunities for everyone to post and you still have the um, ability to upvote and get more points that way. Because right. not just the person asking the question can upvote and accept you, you can get points from, from, from anyone, right? right? Yeah. Uh, and part of the value of Stack Overflow, going back to the half wiki, half forum, is being able to have the, this uh, choral, what do I call it, this choral explanations, as in this multitude of voices contributing to this one answer, right? Yeah. If this is together yeah. as a collective, we're deciding I mean, I, how to I talk. That, but there's two separate things. I think yeah. there's the actuality of whether or not many more people contribute versus maybe the perception if you're one of the people who's, you know, you can sort of justify mm. putting something, like for example, I can, you, know, you can justify putting somebody down if they don't, if they're not as, uh, you know, authoritative, you know, which it sounds like that's the culture, right? If somebody mm. you know, doesn't have a good answer, they get, you know, they get uh, negative feedback essentially, right? Well, so, it seems like a hypothesis that's testing. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. 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 <laughs> I guess that, yes. there's, there's probably no point in going on, but I, 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 you know, I read economics, and I, yes. so I have this kind of economic perspective on behavior, and it does seem like in this case there might be a relationship. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm sorry, I just, there is another Let's go, yeah. I mean, the reason Nikolai is on there so much is because of Z3. So, sure. mm -hmm. so people have frameworks that they actually maintain, and so you can also look at it as producer-consumer, like um, you're the producer of a framework that you want people to consume, and one of the ways that, that you show that it's a good product is you're responsive, and that Stack Overflow is, is the way to respond is a way to re respond to your users. So, so fundamentally, there's also a, you know, very popular framework for people to probably c 
compete a lot. There's probably a huge long tail of things for people. So I would say there's yeah. probably, it's not scarce. There's probably so many things people want to know about in right. the long tail. Right. Um, and as new, as new languages pop up, right, as new tools pop up, there's, there's a new opportunity to post. There's a new culture essentially going around how we talk about a particular topic. Even, even a, a lot of the Visual Studio extensions, they're linked to Stack Overflow questions. They say, oh, let's check out this on Stack Overflow if you're building an extension. And, and that's the, you can search for this tag and it's linked from the Microsoft Visual right. Studio website to so engage. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so good, good questions. Good yes. So it feels like there's an opportunity here to play games with the Stack Overflow search function where you could potentially discover some, let's say, linguistic features that go along with uh, posts that make people feel strange or discomfort or intimidating size, or whatever, and modify the search search ranking system to down uh, to, to down rank those results and post things that are more friendly and put, post those higher. Yes, even building on, yes and, of the building where you're even typing the title of your question, um, if you know this person, so you, by that point you have an account, right? If you can tell the point value, uh, the values and the badges that this person has in other languages they contributed to, maybe if they're a new user, let's, that's another opportunity to, to change the ranking algorithm of what you're showing. Or maybe not show anything at all so let's get that first experience. But there's the downside of that too, of just throwing them into the fire, right? So, yeah. Did you have a hand? Okay. All right. Um, I'm already at 30 minutes. Uh, <coughs> let's, uh, <laughs> hmm. Um, okay, real quick. Uh, is it going to click? Okay, big. The, so this is, all this conversation is great. So the, the point here is that yes, there's unwelcoming atmosphere on Stack Overflow, um, and participants really uh, acknowledge that. This boys club idle chatter can be discouraging, but two, participants have every intention to post. They want to post. They want to engage in some way, but are unclear on the opportunities on how to do that. Okay, I'm just going to just address this briefly, and then go to the next one. So the impact of some of these barriers is that after doing that work for FSC, um, Jeff Atwood, who again is the founder of Stack Overflow, really highlighted the work and even um, trying to be intentional, trying to uh, propose new tools of ways of engaging and inviting newcomers. Um, I haven't seen that one in action. I haven't asked him about that. Um, but what's helpful for that process is to be posting the blog. So that's been able to help facilitate some of these um, collaborations with industry for myself. Um, but they also allow users, so people who are not in participants in my studies, to engage with, um, with each other. And uh, so this participant goes on, or this user goes on to talk about, you know, how they're identified as a woman, how the hip by help vampire is real, of people always constantly sucking that or trying to get their quick answers from the community and kind of reducing the value in it. So. But th the point was that the blogs are helpful, Jeff Atwood liked it, and that facilitated a collaboration with Stack Overflow, which is the mentorship program. So uh, I'll briefly talk about this real quick, which is the, the novice experience is essentially what I highlighted earlier. Um, they're ill-received, so a lot of them have low votes. Uh, again, somebody commenting on the actual blog, uh, which goes on to say, you know, more often than not, my post gets downvoted because I didn't follow some arcane etiquette. Um, and then here, another, but participants are interested in contributing. So this participant goes on to say, or this commenter on a blog goes on to say, you know, is there some trick to making this work? Um, so that's what we're trying to figure out. Is there a trick? You know, how do we get novices to hex well-received questions? To do this, we're understanding Stack Overflow as this community of practice. So again, I highlighted this earlier where each thread is a way to determine how we're going to talk about a topic. Experts are coming, experts and novices alike are coming to a thread to understand something, it could be something new, but also evaluating how we're going, the dialogue, how the sentiment of what's allowed when we talk about this, this topic. Um, so you can kind of compare this to Wikipedia, right, where the people are learning from mutual engagement. Again, novices and experts learning in the same space. So I'm trying to put this different lens on question and answer communities. Um, and to do that, we're trying to figure out how we can increase mutual engagement through this legitimate peripheral participation. And to do that, we did this with the Stack Overflow Exploratory Study. Um, so, <laughs> so you probably noticed a familiar face here. Yeah. So this is an exploratory study. Um, so in order to do that, we had a, a closed private space where we had novices and mentors engage. Um, and this is Slack. Um, but we were really trying to pilot and simulate what this would look like before doing this on platform. But there were a couple of things that went wrong here. I'm trying to figure out how we were going to do this engagement. One, there was this context switching between platforms. Uh, so we were trying to recreate this activity of, or encourage novices to ask better questions. 
But here you see there was a, a copy post, uh, a copy paste from Stack Overflow. So there's this, this constant context switching, this high cognitive load switching between platforms that can, can encourage disengagement. Likewise, this asynchronous communication. You notice here that the novice went on to ask a question at 1257. The mentor here went on at 7 or 9 p.m. That's six hours later. You know, the, the novice didn't need help. That's not Titus, it's somebody else, right? Um, the novice didn't need help then. Um, the novice didn't need help six hours later. They needed help then, right? Um, so that was important. That's what we learned. Also, the dialogue that we were trying to correct here or trying to create didn't refine questions. Um, it really just added, it added a little bit of noise. Um, so long story short, we learned a lot from that experience, um, from this pilot study, of what we want this peripheral participation to look like. Um, so we kind of with a couple of design principles for that. We wanted to make sure we allowed, what we found helpful was that allowing mistakes to happen in a private space, again, uh, this was a private Slack channel, um, was very helpful for novices and mentors alike. Also, the ability to provide formative, so this iterative, timely feedback. So again, when novices need to help, not six hours later, that's the value. So we're now even further realizing the value of Stack Overflow is that you can get answers in the short amount of time, and how imp that's very important for novices. But also, again, we wanted to create this legitimate peripheral participation, a new pathway to participation. So we wanted to teach novices to ask better questions, not ask them for them, or not ask them for them. So teaching them to fish, not fishing for them. Um, so that was something we learned that was really important. Sorry, so I can help, help to get the impression that so Slack is much later than Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow predates Slack. So Slack is a different medium. Yes. And may provide alternative means of, of covering some space that Stack Overflow intersects with or extends Stack Overflow. So, in my world view, there are, there are, I mean, there's the Stack Overflow, then there's GitHub, and then there's uh, Teams and Slack. And, mm -hmm. and um, so, so the, the I mean, what may be a barrier of entry in one forum doesn't translate to the other forum. So what you were saying, you, know, you pointed out that if you have privacy, then it helps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we wanted to see how if it would help, if that added value to the experience. Because right now on Stack Overflow, when you post the answer, or even if you're a new user, it goes to the public, the public sphere. Um, and you're, sometimes people call it public shaming, people have the shame monster in Game of Thrones, right? Where everyone can publicly see you're getting downvoted. Um, people can publicly see your, your comments that are like, this isn't helpful, this isn't adding value to the site, this, is, this belongs somewhere else, right? So, but those are the experiences translating from our barriers that are discouraging to users. So, so, for example, a barrier was this intimidated community size. How do we make the community feel uh, smaller? That's less intimidating. Mm -hmm. How do we get the community smaller? And how does that, how does that encourage participation? So really trying to re-understand, again, the barriers as a framework to how we can build interventions. So I think here Slack was a, almost a simulation of what might happen if in Stack Overflow you could direct people to a chat. Like it wasn't really a study on Yeah, it was not a study on Slack. Let me, yeah, yeah. It was just the platform we used for that. Yes. Technical angle to such a. Exactly. Downvoting is a design tweak. Yes. I guess in the grand scheme of things, you have like a new technical angle that can change much more. Exactly. That's exactly right. So we're trying to see if that was valuable. And that's what we did here with this next part. Um, so we implemented this feature, um, this collaborative editing feature. It's really hard to see, but this is a, a collaborative question draft. Here we have the body of the question, or the title of the question, the tags, the body, so the co-snippet as well. Um, and we put this in a private channel. So we went, we, from the Slack, we understood that that was actually valuable to have. Um, but in order to do that on platform, that required a lot of buy-in from stakeholders, so we need to test that out before. Um, so good question. So we have this help, we call this this private help room, and we had about four of them. But in this help room, you can get feedback from a mentor um, privately in a private space and not on the public forum on your question. So feedback on how to improve your question, essentially. And we implemented that through this just-in-time mentorship study. Yes? Can I just connect to, uh, so are there existing FAQs about um, kind of what the protocol or best practices kind of things? Yes. And how, how do those relate? It seems like some level, yeah, I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah, so it's funny you even mentioned that because um, we did have some, uh, 
we had mentors select who they wanted to help on their own. So we had human mentors help human novices, and I'll go through that in a little bit. Um, and it was actually kind of interesting to see what mentors thought was available or was appropriate to feedback to give novices. And at one point, they were slacking them the uh, MCVE, so you know, minimum viable example, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the, there's a Stack Overflow page that says how to ask. But the value here, or what mentors decided amongst themselves, essentially was if users already knew those resources, if those resources were helpful, they would already be using them, mm -hmm. right? right. Um, so, so now this, this experience, this mentorship experience, now provided or kind of made concrete the type of feedback that mentors or that novices really need. Um, right, I see. Right. Yeah. Versus like a long page of text so that says how to down ask. And really out, yeah, exactly. Yeah, again, yeah. exactly. So again, understanding that experience. So this is a good question, Ben. Yeah. Um, so to do this, we did the just-in-time mentorship study. Um, there, there were four design goals, and there's a lot of them. I won't go over too much. But the main point was that we wanted to understand the benefits so we can eventually scale them. This experiment does not scale in this current state. So they, they're really clear. Human mentors and human offices, and I'll talk more about the recruitment strategies if you're interested as well. Um, but again, since working and collaborating with industry, it was important to understand the question quality, uh, satisfaction of our novices and our expert users alike. Um, and improve that feedback experience. Um, so. so now we'll step through the mentorship study and how they engage with the platform, and then I'll talk about the data we collected, and I've, I'm assuming there'll be a lot of questions about what we had access to and things like that. Um, so step one, to enter the, this mentorship program, a novice will write a question. Once they complete the title and the body of the question, uh, there's a button at the bottom that says, you know, post. When they press post, a modal will pop up that says, there's an experienced mentor available uh, to give you feedback on your question. <coughs> would, you like feed, would you like to connect with them, or would you just like to post your question? And this, this gives the scenario that the person clicks yes. From there, the uh, novice is entered, enters a help room, this private help room. Essentially, it's, just a, it's a chat room. Stack Overflow has chats. They had it for a long time. They opened them up to a larger group of people in about a couple years ago. Um, so we just took advantage of an existing mechanism. Before they were for elite users at one point. Mm -hmm. um, Just a clarification. Yes. So everybody uh, gets their own private help, uh, help room? No. Okay. We only had four help rooms. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and we had, and I'll talk about that mess uh, <laughs> a couple <laughs> minutes. So, yes, yeah, so we had over 70,000 eligible novices. So, I'll start there. And we had four help rooms. But I'll talk more. Again, again, it did not scale. We we're trying to figure out what we needed to do so it can scale, right? Yes. So, um, so, good question. So they enter the help room, the mentor reads the question and gives them feedback. Um, they're presented with an automated message at first, and then you know, a human mentor is saying, you know, hi, I'm going to give you feedback. So from there, let's say the mentor continues to uh, suggest edits for the question. At any time, the novice can go in and edit their question. And this is an example of what it looks like to use the collaborative editing feature. You still have the same consistent markdown text. You have your, your title, your tags, et cetera, and you can actually see the timestamp of when the last edit was made. Again, mentors can see this. Fishing, uh, teaching novices to fish, not fishing for them. Only novices can edit questions. Mentors can suggest edits. In fact, at any time throughout this experience, and the novice doesn't find this helpful, they can just disengage and just say, I'm going to post my question to the platform. Um, cool. OK, so now going back to the experiment. So this was a 33-day study conducted on Platform Live, um, so on Stack Overflow. Uh, so we had, oh, okay, yeah, we had four help rooms, um, four help rooms. So when a novice entered, novices were routed to these help rooms, and we had one private mentor room where, amongst themselves, mentors can suggest uh, or select novices to help, and even amongst themselves, even try to figure out what's the best feedback to give a novice. So I talked about that FAQ and MCVE as well. Um, yeah. So we had 70,000 eligible novices. This is 25% of the eligible novices we had in this time. Eligible novice means any user with less than 15 points or has asked three questions and received an upvote. That's the, that's received? received upvotes. Because that's the, so the reason we allowed that is for, say for example, you asked a question before, but maybe you didn't have a great experience. It's still valuable for you. We figured it was super valuable to still be engaged in this experience. So of the 70,000, we have only about 520 entered the room, which is kind of expected. And we had, um, it was a new feature, and we had kind of expected these new users to just really be interested in posting their question and leaving, right? That help vampire, I'm going to post it and leave and leave there. Um, 
we had 271 novices actually engaged. So we had a lot of people enter the room and then just curious to peek in and leave. But we had 271 novices engaged with our 63 mentor um, and had 343 conversations and were just the dialogues between each one. So when they enter the room, they're able to read the other conversations as well? Yes. Okay. Good question. So that's also part of the um, feature, not a bug, where, <laughs> where novices can actually see other people getting feedback. So now it's not like I'm this creepy, I'm in this private room where previously I know that people on Sacco floor are trolls and this troll is just going to privately attack me. Oh, other people are going to construct the feedback as well. Um, so, Also, we didn't have enough resources to do like 70,000 rooms. So. <laughs> so, but <laughs> again, features. <laughs> um, so from that experience, we had about, uh, we uh, analyzed the transcripts and we had used the question scores from each question because an upvote or a downvote on the question kind of, that's how the community perceives your response or your, your question. Yes, Andy. Um, how were the mentors chosen and were they paid or, or trained mm -hmm. before the study? So we had, uh, before the study, we posted this post on Stack Overflow Meta. So Meta Stack Exchange is the community where you can experienced users or anyone who's really familiar with it can suggest new features, um, complain about old ones. Um, so, these are, so essentially this community, this MetaSaco flow community, is already really active in that feedback process and wants to see improvements um, or removal of other things. So when we posted about the mentorship program we were doing, we were saying we're doing the study, what should it look like? So we are getting feedback on there as well. In that post, we link to a survey where they can uh, apply to be a mentor. From there, myself and Christina Lustig, who is a researcher at Stack Overflow, um, the first researcher at the time, uh, we skimmed the list. Of, we asked them about their previous mentorship experiences. So we reviewed their uh, experiences posting on Stack Overflow. We removed trolls, people who were on the blacklist on Stack Overflow, which I wouldn't have had access to if I did this on my own. So that was the, the benefit of working with Stack Overflow. They have their own internal lists of people who are just mean. So <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how to say that. Um, so good, so good question. We actually surveyed novices and interviewed mentors. Um, I don't have that in the be right. I'm not going to talk about that right now, but I can bring that up if you're interested as well. So way back at the beginning, you talked about how the software engineers didn't look like them. You had to like the profiles and the avatars. Yes, as a was proposed a, reason. Yeah. So was that a consideration here, like diversity of the mentors, to sort of, if if that was a hypothesis of yeah. being a problem, was that taken into account here, or was it? So this is a good question. Um, so for this experience, no, and I'll tell you why. Again, we were trying to target the few, help the many. So targeting the few is just a way for us to understand the problem for this niche community, essentially. Um, but again, identifying that these problems is for everyone, right? Um, so these mentors were from all over, and they're all over the globe as, as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, some were from Egypt. I don't, probably won't talk about more of them because some are from Egypt, from some Russia. They're, they're globally dispersed, and that's on purpose because the novices answering questions or asking questions are from all over as well. Um, novices were only exposed, only presented the option to enter the help room if a mentor was already in there. It only so the option only showed up if there was someone available. They're geographically diverse. In the yes, they're yes, they're all geodispersed. Um, you asked, you asked me something else. I was going to answer. Well, I didn't know if they were like. Other measures. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Gender for mentors or right. So for a Stack Overflow's logging, so you, there's no way to verify the gender or identity of a person on Stack Overflow. And I'll say not yet, because I think there's some pushing towards that. Um, so for logging purposes, all we had access to was when they asked the question and when they, or when they type what the title of the question and were they able to answer. Um, and that, and then that point, that, that's how we identify that that's a person. There was no other way to identify that their experiences before, so no, no pairing mechanisms at this point. But I think a lot of this work would demonstrate that there's incentives or there's value in doing pairing in that way. Great question. Uh, so um, high level results. Uh, we noticed that mentors' questions had a higher quality. So what I mean is that we saw a 50% increase in score on average from mentor versus non-mentored questions. Uh, so, and this work was published at Kai, I didn't say that earlier. So we conducted this chi-squared analysis on the percentage of questions using Stack Overflow's very sophisticated data science framework, which is where positive questions are, are marked as good, so any question with a positive score, neutral questions are ones with a zero, and negative ones are bad. So essentially, so this is this, this is what their data science gave us. Because again, I mean, I was on external at this part. Um, we're seeing less bad questions, right, and more questions, so more positively rated questions. 
Um, so, yeah. Um, there are, in addition to that, uh, we conducted a qualitative analysis. Yes. How many total questions were posted as a result of the mentor program? So there are over 500 questions I had when I looked at it last time. Okay. So a lot of people did end up, so there are, in our community triage, which is where the questions belong, we did see that some mentors actually just kind of helped navigate questions that maybe belonged in a different community or didn't even belong to Sacco Flow at all. Um, and I'll talk about that next. So, uh, so this is an example of a community triage where a mentor went on to say, okay, the fact is, that on Stack Overflow, you can't ask for all those libraries. You need to do that somewhere else. Um, so this is an example of one person on, on another question saying, your question may belong in super user or server faults. Um, well, the, the fact is on Stack Overflow, again, there's over 172 Stack Exchange communities. Um, Stack Overflow is one of them. Oh, when I said Stack, Stack Exchange under the Stack Exchange umbrella, software engineering is another big one. Um, which sometimes can be confusing on which questions belong where, right? Um, but most novices weren't familiar with that. Um, I, I, a lot of people laugh, and I guess a lot of, you know, we talked about the math and the Stack Exchange or other ones, but there's, there's a lot of them. There's an area 52 you can create and just make your own Stack Exchange community. Um, but again, so we saw uh, mentors kind of act as our guards for the community in a way. I don't like to say guards, but um, protected the community in a way where they were able to reroute questions that didn't belong. So one novice went on to say, hey, how do I hack a Wi-Fi password? That was it, no code snippet. That was, that was it. And it was like that, that's an example of a question that just didn't belong there. And it's actually kind of funny because mentors amongst themselves, um, we, had a, we had them generate a, a document, which is our, we called it a mentorship FAQ, which is linked in the paper somewhere. But together we decided what is appropriate before, uh, together amongst themselves, and myself kind of like chaired it, but uh, what's appropriate to respond. Um, so we actually kind of see, it was funny to see how they talked about it, and then they went back to the document to kind of, you know, form how we're going to, reform the dialogue or how we discourage or reroute questions. So is this the first attempt on at Stack Overflow to actually create such mentors and sort of figure out you know what where what, you know what their behavior would be like? Yes. Um, so I think so. The, is so yes. This is a collaboration with Stack Overflow, and this was the first time doing it. But this is I mentioned Christina was the first researcher. So we <laughs> right. this 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 was yeah. published in 2018. Amazing. I think we did this in August of 2017. Wow, that's amazing. Um, and she had just got there, and it's funny because we already had. So there was already dialogues with other people who were software engineers who were joining Stack Overflow. Um, and then when they got the researcher, it was like, oh, we have a person who can do this thing from the paper you mentioned in the blog, which is why the blog was helpful, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Just another question. I guess I have to wonder if you're, you know, from the Stack Overflow side, not having done this for all these years. Yeah. Like, why did they not think it would be useful? It seems like, a, you know, app, yeah. in retrospect, hindsight. Yeah. It's funny you even mentioned that because even on the meta pages, um, there's so on the meta stack of overflow page where I said we proposed that we're going to do this thing finally, people have been proposing. Uh, so users have been saying there should be like some type of coaching huh. guidance. <laughs> but I think resources, um, okay. I think resources were a big so part of it. The, the human element of it. Like yeah. How to get the mentors. Right. Or even how to get buy in that this is valuable and, and good to do on the platform. Which is why I think, so every time we talk about the work, Jeff and Jeff Atwood is the founder and Julia Sill, which is a data scientist, they, they share the blog, right? They share the paper. Because it's now, it's, now it's empirical findings and I'm linking them to other ones as well. And it's like they're, now that it's a stated problem external, it seems more valuable, I suppose. I, I really can't, I really don't know, I bet. Yeah. But it also looks yeah. like there are these uh, bots at yeah. Georgia Tech that are answering questions for students writing very popular so like this one, like, do we need a human to do that? Yeah. But you know, you could, if you have an interaction some, with something via chat, you might, your experience might be improved. Right. Uh, as a, so, so that one in particular, yeah. you know, you could imagine if you get like a, a large enough corpus, you could have, you could have bots that handle maybe a lot of the, a lot of the novice questions that need to be routed. Like to other places. Right. And, that, and that's exactly right. So some people, I um, can't remember his name, Chung Yan Chen, who submitted a paper to CSCW like the following year, um, used recurrent neural networks to understand how people were editing posts, right? So figuring out how we can automate some of this. Um, well, I won't do it now. Yeah. Off, right. right. It's, it's a fundamental problem. Yeah. These platforms. Yeah. It's I, and it's funny, one of the other experiences we had was when the, the novices 
one time they entered the chat and they're like, wait a minute, are you a real person? <laughs> right? Um, I mean, it, it kind of speaks to this, the, the way we talk, the way we help and the help systems in place to, to um, encourage code behavior. Everything, yeah, right? But also, what, what isn't automated nowadays, right? Um, and again, one of the biggest, the categories of barriers was this impersonal interactions, right? So not being able to see the human in someone. So that was really interesting. Because um, the mentor was like, yes, I'm a human. Okay, let's get back to this. I have other people to help. That's just what a bot would say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Did, did you get any gender data on how this was? So, no. So, so again, Stack Overflow does not reveal gender, does not qualify or ask for gender. But, so the, I did a smaller study. So not out, of, not out of this mentorship study. But, yeah, okay, I was going to say something else. I'll just talk about that later. So, but we did see there were cultural interests that were happening. I might just get to that real quick, actually, because... they make a huge difference? I mean, like, I don't know if you overlap with Ayushi uh, or with my intern. Mm -mm. So usually people in GitHub don't answer surveys. And, you know, folks in Singapore sent them a survey. They looked up the dean and complained to the dean that your professors are sending us surveys. So she sent a survey, and she got 4,000 people to respond. And part of it was because, you know, she actually used automatic translators. She figured out that people were in France, Mm -hmm. She translated the survey and sent it to them in French. Like after half a day, people were like, "Don't use Google Translate. Just tell us in English. We appreciate uh. the effort, so we'll take the survey." <laughs> but you know, and you know, a lot more people took it, and she personalized it. She just skimmed their names off yeah. and said, "Dear Bob, dear Alice," and that increased their chances of taking the survey. Because so it seems more personal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this, going back to your point, so we didn't ask for. Um, Cultures, we didn't particularly select mentors based on their background is like that as well. But we did see that one novice, that one mentor, after they helped the novice, um, they went on to say, you know, hey, are you from Egypt by chance, right? And it's funny because I was in the chat at this time, and so was my colleague. And um, we were like, wait a minute, are we going to have to flag this person? We weren't sure how this was going to go. Um, and a novice went on to say, you know, I actually am, you know, thank you for noticing. And they were like, okay, see you around, right? So it would be interesting to see if this type of Bond kind of fosters this other type of mentorship, as in, am I going to follow, not follow you around, but also encourage you in other questions? Am I going to track your behavior and see, um, and be your cheerleader in the corner and always upvote you, right? Um, so, and you can get this type of information. So what I'm saying is that you can, you can actually identify it as well. Because on Sagoflow, you can list your location, even though there's not necessarily verified, as well as your name. So, um, so this interest. Um, but my future work is trying to figure out how we can take advantage of it. I don't like saying take advantage. Be actionable about it. Um, so I'll skip over this real quick. Um, helpful thing here was that, there, uh, again, we talked a little bit about automation, the ability to automate some of the findings. So it's kind of, we talked about this bots in a way. So Stack Overflow's developer affinity group has started this template, this question asking template, essentially where, okay, show your code. Is there a code snippet here? Okay, check, right? We shouldn't be posting. If you're asking about compiler errors and you're talking about what you did, there should be a code snippet, right? Also, your question sounds a lot like this other question. It, did you link to it? We can, it's markdown. We can check for the brackets and the, and the parentheses. Okay, is it a link to a Stack Overflow question? You look for the URL, right? There's ways to automate um, that kind of makes sense, essentially, and they're in some ways happening on the, on the question answer template where you first type extra question on Stack Overflow, but maybe we should do that elsewhere as well. So this was actually really helpful because uh, that's Jay Hanlon, Executive Vice President for uh, Develop Affinity and Growth? No, uh, Community and Growth. And he highlighted the work as well in their Summer of Change, right? So I think it was the ability to have an academic pairing partner to encourage this happening. And I think that was a major part of it. So after that, Julia Silge, who was the data scientist at Stack Overflow, um, really went on to talk about uh, the work with Christina and myself and started this academic mentorship or academic research partnership program so people can conduct their other studies on platform. And I, I think it was really, I, I mentioned this because I think it may be a good opportunity to, to encourage other organizations to do that. I know Microsoft Research is already one that does it, obviously. But other organizations as well. Um, so even compare studies across different platforms um, with academic partners. I was asking Tom about that earlier, so. Um, so really cool to see that happen. All right, I'm going to get an hour. Uh, so I'll go over the vision briefly real quick. So uh, I, I conducted a smaller study on Stack Overflow where we identified questions where, well, in the study we noticed that when women answered questions from other women, they were reengaging sooner, and we call this idea pure parity. Um, so just, just trying to really 
drill deeper to identify if, sig if available identity signals, so using this, we use the first name of the user, so again, not necessarily verified, um, but being able to see how identity may be encouraging participation. So in that, in that brief experiment, we saw that uh, women were responding, uh, who answered questions from other women, were responding 330 days sooner um, in the cumulative density. So um, just trying to drive home the point uh, that makes you kind of ask the question, when, what does asking for help in the future look like? And, oh, I have a quarter. I would say that it looks a lot like using identity signals. Anyway, um, so I think Bogdan Veselescu from CMU said it best. Um, software is being globally, or uh, being developed by increasingly distributed and increasingly diverse groups of individuals. Um, I would say that how our programmers' identities presented it will become increasingly influential. So to kind of drive from that point, I'll briefly talk about three projects that I can see myself con conducting here at Microsoft. Um, and they centered around uh, context collapse, uh, control over presentation of identity, and empowerment. Um, so for the first one, I want you to consider spam emails. So these filters are helpful for uh, weeding out emails that may not be as helpful, uh, that you don't need. So it's, for example, using signals of trust such as, has I, have I received the email from this person before? Has this person sent malicious content to others as well? I would say that software engineers are using similar signals to trust signals or to trust pull requests from each other. But are they using the right signals? What are the right signals? Do these signals change based on attributes of the code? Um, so you're right now you're looking at a brief image, uh, a video that I conducted. This work is published at XCC. This uh, we're sending it in May. That bef I'm gonna run it back, but before the person can make a verbal contribution or verbally acknowledge whether or not they're going to accept or um, so merge or not merge the pull request, they go on to look at the profile before. So this is the code snippet that one commit of your pull request. That's me and my bun. It was a high bun that day. And then here you look at the before they make a decision. They're going back to the profile image. They're going back to their contribution activity um, to make before they make a decision before they verbally acknowledge. Um, is this the way that developers always want to be reflected, or is this really reflect the contributions? Should we build systems to give developers more control over how they share contributions based on the pull request they're submitting? So maybe we should be able to reduce and amplify signals based on <coughs> based on the type of submit uh, pull request we're submitting. I'm interested in seeing what that looks like. <laughs> Also, as online communities begin to evolve, we're starting to see a, little, a lot more control of variety of who you can share with and, and how. Um, so this ability to ask questions to a specialized audience, um, does, that, does that allow the depth of technical knowledge that we're able to distribute increase? Um, also, this is an ability to have the segmented anonymity of, of how we communicate this knowledge. Does that encourage computing to be more pervasive? And, and when, I, when I say that, I want us to think about as our online communities, um, as our traditionally technical communities become more social, so GitHub now having statuses as of a couple months ago, right? and our traditionally social communities becoming more technical, and this is just an example of someone asking for SDKs on Facebook, on my Facebook feed at least, um, does this allow, again, does this allow community to be more pervasive? Um, does this, this context collapse of these communities? This is allow us more to bring of our authentic self from our offline spaces into our technical contributions. So again, going back to evaluation, should I be evaluated on those as well if they're going to be uh, available? I'm interested in studying how that context collapse shifts, or how that context collapse allows social capital to shift in these communities, um, and how we communicate our technical knowledge. I'm, I'm going over this kind of fast because I feel like I'm way over time at this point. Um, uh, and finally, in our previous, uh, in my previous study I did on I look, at, look, oh, look, 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 I look like an engineer on Twitter, um, we were able to see that when identifiable marginalized identities were able to connect, um, they were able to sh have the shared being the only oneness, essentially, and be able to feel more empowered in these spaces, and thus encouraged to engage in their specific uh, engineering disciplines. Is there a way to kind of recreate this for software developers specifically? Um, in these communities that we're engaging in? Because um, if you think about it, if these marginalized people are not engaging in our deep technical communities, 
Where are they seeking help? Where are they going? Why aren't we there? How, how do we make our spaces look more like those even, even better, right? Um, so referring to communities like askquestions.tech, which brands itself as this inclusive place to ask technical questions. So they're using a discourse platform as well. As our studio as well, they are starting to emphasize more the ability to be civil um, and encourage healthy conversations. But maybe this ability to have cultural identity be prevalent or be visible, salient, is valuable. Excuse me, so Philip Well in this Python Tutor tool, um, if you log on to Python Tutor and select Get Live Help, you'll be able to see that other users from different countries, or yeah, from different countries, this one's just showing the US, oh, this is on as well, Spain mm -hmm. and Ohio, if you're able to connect people based on their cultural demographics or where they're located, does that encourage uh, people to engage in a different way? But even more so, how can we kind of encourage people to use these tools? So thinking about from the Stack Overflow Developer Survey, uh, Visual Studio was the most highly uh, responded tool, the most popular tool the developers said they use, like 34%. And it was about 70,000, over 70,000 developers. And again, this is at the global scale. Um, these tools allow other people to contribute, right, through, through extensions. I mentioned extensions earlier. Is there a way to kind of encourage participation through, uh, through building inclusive extensions in a way? What does that even mean, right? What does inclusive extensions look like? Um, I know a lot of, a lot of times the, sometimes the effort is placed on the marginalized people to build these systems. We as researchers, we as allies, have the ability to lead the dialogue in how these systems can be built. Visual Studio is a perfect out-of-the-box tool that you can add extensions to it and engage. Can, can we, should we encourage the ability to build extensions around these cultural competencies? This one's about gender um, language. If you can see, it's kind of hard to see, so I'm going to actually say what it says. So there's, I've seen in the world two philosophies around yeah. the idea of inclusion. One of them is to erase um, the all markers of diversity, like your friend's solution. Um, and another one is to deliberately make those incredibly obvious to everyone and make sure that uh, you can find your people on whatever site you're going to. Yeah. What's your philosophy around this and which do you think might be more successful? Mm, that's a good question. So my philosophy is that is yes and. There's values in having uh, things not be identifiable if that's how you as the user chooses to be visible in these spaces. So I believe, I find it valuable to have the marginalized communities be able to communicate and have signals of their identity if they so choose. Because the value is being able to connect, again, going back to what I mentioned earlier, connect with other shared marginalized identities. There's value added there but maybe you want to connect with other people as well. You should be able to have the ability to decide whether you want to be presenting to one community differently than the other. That's what I'm emphasizing. That's, that's, that's what I'm trying to say. So for example, if I identify as a woman, I'm very visibly a woman, right? I identify as a woman, maybe I want to be very visible to other women, so maybe there's a badge I want to be able to have on my account that only other women can see so they know for sure, like, okay, I see her. Um, and maybe if there's certain opportunities or certain contexts of when I'm submitting or making submitting a new extension, that I don't want all that information available unless I've already engaged with that person in a different context, right? So, so that's, that's a good question. So, um, so the way I kind of, I think I had a nice little way I was, I was going to say this. Er, uh, okay, I'm going to repeat what I said here. Can we intentionally craft opportunities to invite diverse perspectives to the table? be equitable with the resources to build, so encouraging people to build these extensions, um, and then inclusively sustain participation. And that looks different for everyone. Everyone needs different resources to be supported. So there's a lot of YouTube tutorials to learn how to do extensions on Visual Studio. Maybe this is our way to kind of encourage cultural, like encourage cultural competencies here and build these fun, build fun extensions that search for how you can remove gender context from your, from your code or remove profanity if that's something you're interested in. That's the other picture I removed, but. Um, but yeah. So I'm interested in studying that and what that looks like. Um, it's very open, but I think there's, there's something interesting there. So in summary, I talked a little bit about the unfamiliar norms and how those can present barriers to underrepresented groups, including women and novices in these platforms, in these programming communities. But understanding these barriers as a framework <coughs> can be helpful to build interventions, such as the just-in-time mentorship experience that um, kind of reduces intimidating community size, this fear of negative feedback, we flipped a bit on that to have constructive feedback in a private space. Um, and, and I propose that this vision of we can learn how to empower, connect 
um, and build systems that kind of take advantage of identity signals that are already there. People are using them. How do we get smart about using them? How do we get smart about giving control to other people and how they want to be used? So with that, I'll close and I'll thank you all for your time. Question, yeah. um, and we can talk about it later too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so I, it seems like one opportunity, uh, you know, instead of sort of thinking about, say, Stack Overflow and its history and things like that, is to think about, you know, there's many more people who will be entering this kind of world and the education, you know, the, the space around how people are being educated, you know, to, to know more about computer science. So do you have thoughts about how? Um, you know, if you sort of you start with a, a blank slate, you know, and you could, you know, you could, you're creating. Let's say we're going to have ten times as many programmers ten years from now as we have right now. Like, there's, you know, nine tenths of those people are new. Mm -hmm. um, could we, could we create, could we leverage that in some sense? And how, and what do you think? We could yeah, do? Um, I I agree. There was this number by either Evans Data or U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics that said by 2023, which is actually coming up now, we will need 43 million developers. 40 million developers, at this rate, we'll have 23 million by that time. So this is this idea of the technical jobs that are starting to arise, yeah. so including data scientists, software engineers, um, different people working in information retrieval, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there is a need, there's a gap to fill. Um, I think that from the education perspective, I think these online tools that people are, have uh, are valuable. And it's kind of sometimes kind of disturbing to find out that on these online tools, like on Stack Overflow, there's no verify, verification of your identity. You can be anyone you want to be, right? And, and that's still discouraging. So I, I think figuring out how we can make it more comfortable to be, you can be whoever you want to be, make that more salient, more clear that that's okay, um, can allow us to understand across even other cultures, because there's different, every country and every different culture has different norms. How we'll make it more comfortable or maybe get more accepting for you to bring that to these platforms, to bring that to your coding experiences. Why should you have to check that out the door, right? Good question, Ben. Yeah. I'm sort of curious. On the flip side, has anybody ever done a study of the jerks? So, like, <laughs> the people who are on the blacklist. Yeah. Because right now we're treating them as a black box, so mm -hmm. to speak, of, like, we have newcomers who are contributing, and then the black box is coming and squashing them, right? But could we open up the black box and figure out? Because I can imagine a, a variety of motivations for the jerky behavior. And some of them are probably, you know, you could have interventions for those mm -hmm. as well. Um, so I don't know. Is it, I'm yeah. just curious, since you know the literature, has anybody studied the, the bad behavior? So first, I'll, I'll address the earlier part. Essentially, the people who are mentors could have been exhibiting jerky behavior. They're moderators, right? And the moderators will close your question and mark your questions protected and to say prevent spam, right? And I think giving them, uh, giving space, making a space where we're declaring it as this helpful, constructive thing, which is essentially what we did with the private mentorship ex example. We had some people who were just, who actually were saying like inappropriate, hateful things. So there's those people on the blacklist. But the, essentially, the moderators could have been perceived as just that. Mm. And I think giving them that space to say, this is constructive, uh, keep the user in mind. I think the example that Jeff Atwood had before of, this is, a new, this is a novice user, like, and there's a hand wave, like, be kind or think about the code of contact before you engage. I think being explicit about that is what's valuable. So even on, on GitHub, there's this contributor covenant that uh, uh, February Keeney, who was on charge of their community and growth, they came up with this covenant so that every project could adopt it if they chose to, mm -hmm. of, their, of how to engage with new users, what's, how, what's their appropriate moderation techniques. And I think, so that's an example of people trying to develop that and use it on their own. Um, but I think Stack Overflow, the entity of Stack Overflow being the, the leader, saying, declaring it that this is a safe space was a different tone versus if I'm just someone who just logged in right now and said, you can't talk to me like that, or you shouldn't talk to people like that. Um, so I think it's important for the people in power, the communities in power, and the leadership in power to be able to, on their side, build systems and make it explicit that it's okay. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So, I know you're way over time, but... Yeah. Um, okay. so, um, <laughs> So I had a question about the, uh, the novices and the questions that they ask. So mm -hmm. one of the things that you see on Stack Overflow um, in terms of sort of obnoxious responses, maybe not hateful, but just obnoxious, yeah. like uh, the link to whatheveyoutried.com or something. 
um, which is the moral equivalent of let me Google that for you. Um, and part of that is because people, I mean, a lot of novices put on questions that are either, um, you know, they should have just searched, right? It's really there. They ask a question like, I have a bug. Why doesn't this work? And there's no information. Or the worst is like homework. Yeah. Manifest yeah. homework. Yeah. Um, and so I wondered of the novices and the questions that they asked in your study, how many of them were what you would characterize as like appropriate questions? And how many were, because you said the Wi Fi hacking one is yeah. obviously terrible. Yeah. So I can tell you that at the end of the 33 days, so this is probably questions that were latter in, in more in the beginning, 15% were closed, 18% were deleted, and that was in, um, and then I mentioned a, a less bad, more good. There were still a lot of negative, <laughs> this doesn't mean there were still a lot of negative, negative questions, uh -huh, right? right. And, and, they, and they resemble homework questions. Yeah. Um, and, they re and novices and mentors were giving the feedback of, like, again, your question, the reason I said, that's able to automate that process, there was a lot of that, where mentors were like, I could just answer this question for them. We're like, that's not what this context is for. You, you know, but so but the mentor would suggest, this sounds a lot like this, Can you, have you checked it? Um, and I think that um, having that automated is important. Um, I was gonna say something else too. I can't remember the other end of your question, but. Well, I just wonder if, if a lot of the behavior that is perceived as right. All right, I'll talk to you later today. Yeah. That's perceived as jerky is because of gatekeeping in a different way than the way that is. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, so also, and I, and I think I kind of tried to allude to this earlier with this transactional mentality of some people, how they use that overflow, um, where they perceive me as, I'm just gonna ask somebody real quick, and like, I'm tapping you, and I'm like, I want you to give me this answer. And that's how some people asking homework questions would, would use the platform. And that's the transaction, that's the forum part of it. And I think the issue here is there's a contrast of mental models of how those people think the community should work versus how the expert users we were talking about before see it as this wiki, right? As this archive, this artifact that should be kept up and moderated delicately, right? And, and preserved. Um, and I think that's the value of the mentorship program is because it kind of offered this uh, non-archival, in a way, it's still archived, but you still go search for it. Yeah. But you now have the ability to have that quick transaction because it is, it's a chat. Right, so maybe there should be always this rite of passage where novices should be to learn the norms in this platform first before engaging on the artifact. But, but if you think about it, the reason some questions are like an artifact is because well, Java has been around since forever. When new languages pop up, like Go and TypeScript, right? There's a new opportunity to to determine how we're going to talk about a language, and maybe it's more important to have that quick banter, right? You know, so so I think it, it would depend based on language. Um, so this is a good question, but. I'm, yeah. yeah, it's just a, a yeah. weird, complicated dance yeah. between encouraging people to contribute and then blocking a yeah. lot of people who are not really contributing who yeah. are kind of like bad for the platform. Yeah, because so, even on... I, I love the idea of the help I'm sending. It's great. Yeah, because um, so Stack, like I mentioned before, but Stack Overflow had it for a while, but it was, and the only reason I knew about it is because from a previous study, one of my participants, the expert user, was saying, yeah, we have this chat thing we've been using for a minute, and then they opened it up. So you, in, in order to use a chat, you have to have 15, you have to have 20 points to engage on the chat. You can look at it if you know what chat room to go to, but you cannot engage. So it's kind of also saying novices shouldn't go here. And I, I kind of think that should be kind of shifted if we put them there first before we preserve the archive, right? So, um, so yeah. Yes? So you talked about uh, diversity in this in different ways. Uh, where do you see like accessibility fitting into your research agenda, or does it fit? Because I see that as another way of creating Inclusion, right? Making yeah. products accessible and things like that. Oh, 100%. Does that sort of fit in this space? 100%. So I was thinking exactly of that when Andy was talking about, because I know he works with the neurodiverse, right? So thinking about how the uh, platforms of building, so building extensions was what I was trying to get at. So when you're building extensions and thinking about the value they add to different groups of people, um, and that's a perfect opportunity to do that. So you can't really see the image, but again, that one was for. Um, that was one was for removing gendered language, or I think it also said something with country, religion, race-related, gender-favoring, unequal phrasing, right? So that, that was very like a umbrella thing. We're going to build this tool to help you remove these, these types of output coming out when you're debugging your code. Um, I think there's opportunities to build tools for how we're, how we're working on extensions or build extensions that kind of enhance uh, haptic abilities. So thinking about if some, so for people who have visual impairments, being able to have haptic feedback versus, and so no visual feedback, no audio feedback, but in ways to build haptic feedback into these extensions so that you can uh, further, what was I gonna say? Engage with the platform in a different way and have that personalized to your experience, so bespoke to your experience. So, but, but that would encourage 
but that we need developers to be encouraged to build extensions that do that. And we shouldn't be relying on the mag, mag, uh, marginalized community to build those systems. So we should be encouraging, encouraging the type of development. And I think that's what's missing. So I see a lot of like almost self-service tools now that yeah. help developers at least be aware of accessibility. Yeah. Uh, problems they're introducing into their systems. Yeah. And I was sort of wondering if, just thinking out loud, if some of this yeah. could be operationalized to say like the tone of the way you wrote the documentation is a is sort of, you might want to check this. Sort yeah. Because essentially what this one does, yeah. that one does. So if you, you can't read a small font, but I was trying to like be funny a little bit. So I spent some time last night trying to identify other cultural ways of in engaging. So I was searching things like race, gender, religion, and try to type in Egypt because that was the example I gave earlier. There's not many that kind of highlight that. And that extensions that are ex publicly available here on this tool Maybe to do that. Maybe this problem a lot more in uh, localization. When yeah. People write it in English, but it comes off a different way when it gets translated and yeah. none of us actually realize the problem has yeah. happened until it's a PR issue or something. Yeah. Mm. I mean, that's, how, that's what normally happens. Yeah. Mm. Yes? Yeah, so a lot of the kind of like issues and challenges you identified in Stack Overflow are like really similar to just like online communities in general. Like Wikipedia has a lot of these issues and like citizen science platforms yes. have a lot of these issues on like onboarding and you have a small number of contributors who do like a lion's share of actual work and things like that. So I was just curious, well I guess I had two questions. The first was that like how generalizable in general do you think some of the things you found in issues in Stack Overflow which is kind of would be useful in general for other citizen science initiatives, other online communities overall. And then the second one is that for your novices, the I really liked your framing, like the question, the asking questions. But I was wondering too if there was like um, some room there to like bring novices in on the more question answering side, because it seems to me like you have there could be novices in two different ways. You could have novices in terms of like I'm new to programming, so I'm just I'm learning a lot of unfamiliar things with programming syntax, things like that, and I'm new to Stack Overflow, so I'm a novice in both ways. Mm -hmm. But you could be, like, people in this room lurkers, so right. you use Stack Overflow, but maybe you've never just gone in and asked, like, answered a question. And if you want to build up this, like, richer, more diverse, more inclusive community, it seems like you have to, like, attack it from both sides. Like, if you're bringing in more people who ask questions, but the people who are asking questions are still the same group of people from the same thing, it seems like you would be, like, running into issues there. So do you also have thoughts too about how to bring in more people to scaffold the question answering side as well? Yes, uh, 100, so yes and Martin. So for the, for the answering side, the way we try to get at the fact that uh, what it's like to answer or what, how that encourages people is that brief pre-parity study I mentioned. But going back, just going back even deeper to what you mentioned the second time, is there's more opportunities to answer questions. There's not answers getting close because they're duplicates, right? That people aren't doing that. They're just we're most likely being downvoted for not valuable. And I think there's a big opportunity to encourage that. So that's the choral explanation. And that's actually adds a different type of utility and value to Stack Overflow. Because some people, the same way they use Stack Overflow, the way you use Quora, which is they have multiple answers that are there. Uh, and, and, that's the, and that's the benefit of using it, being able to have multiple perspectives to the same answer, uh, to the same question. Um, so, yes. And then, first part, you mentioned it built. Yeah, so like, all these online communities, like I know like the Wikimedia oh, yeah. Foundation has done a lot of work on like onboarding, for example. So they build like, I forget what the name of it, it was like T. The tea, the tea house, yeah, the, the tea, tea house, house. Yeah. yeah. Like all these things, so like, hey, how do we get, you know, people of color and other representative groups, women to like do more editing on Wikipedia. So yeah. they've done a lot of work on like thinking those onboarding processes. So I'm just wondering like, the generalizability in general, like, these online forums or citizen science communities, are there things that you're learning here that could just be like generalizable, kind of like design guidelines that mm -hmm. if somebody was building a new citizen science platform, they should think about these these issues that you've identified in Oh, yes, well. yes. So I, I think that what, so yes, it does transfer exactly. Um, so I think the only thing that's unique here is that we're talking about the, the technical contribution here is code. There's other technical contributions in other forms, right? If I'm doing math deck saying I'm talking about theories, right? And that's the technical contribution, and that's formatted a different way as well. What's super generalizable is the ability to have a pathway to participation, which is what legitimate per for participation is. A way to introduce low-hanging fruit to, to give your novices or your newcomers to the platform to encourage them to, uh, as a way to get them practiced and warmed up before they contribute. 
And I think being able to have a chat, so rerouting people to the chat first, if they never if they never answered a question before, gives them the opportunity to the low hanging fruit of maybe you could build points up by engaging in the chat. And then you're building up how to encourage or how to talk about technical topics here on this platform. And then transferring them to the other communities. And that's what the tea house kind of, well, from what I understood at the tea house, that was what they were trying to do. Um, and, and that's the only difference. It looks different based on the, what's the main interaction in different communities as well. Because this one is mostly Q&A um, um, and that forum slash wiki. But on places like Wikipedia, it's really just straight, straight wiki. It's kind of like more of debating of what's appropriate what's the appropriate archive to hold for a topic. Um, so I think, so yes, I'm going to answer your question, so, OK. But, uh, good question. Questions? Anyone? Good. I think good. Okay. I think good. Thank you.